Um, all right, what I'll be talking about is uh, computable phenotype feature selection, which kind of relates to what we've been talking about. And it's kind of how I started down this LLM path and end up somewhere where, where Mike is, is doing it with uh, query construction. Um, so we've talked about this already a lot about computable phenotypes today and yesterday. Uh, and to say we've mentioned the, the example of type 2 diabetes, that there's there's only about half the patients that have a code actually have type 2 diabetes. And we, I always show this table. We did a, a chart review of a random sample of our biobank. And um, but diabetes is actually one of the better ones. Uh, things like schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder have have worse worse PPVs for just one, if you just use one ICD nine or ICD ten code. And the idea is that you can build computable phenotypes to improve this this uh, cohort selection. Um, and so. A big part of machine learning computable phenotype building, uh, as Griffin talked about, is feature selection. Uh, and the reason we do that is because there are hundreds of thousands of, of concepts in Michelle's ontology. And so we have trouble using all of that data in, in building uh, machine learning models on a smaller number of patients. So um, we have to sort of do some grouping and some picking out of what things are, are relevant to the phenotype that we care about. Um, and historically, we, we built a lot of phenotypes uh, over the years. And when we first started, we talked to experts. And we would sit down with them, and we'd go back and forth. And it would take months to say, OK, for this disease, like what, is, what are the relevant diagnoses, medications? lab test procedures, and we'd go back and forth. And um, this is an example. We did a paper on uh, PCOS. And it, it, this, this, this table itself was, was complicated. And it takes uh, informatics and clinical expertise to be able to actually generate that. So it's time consuming and, and also error prone because the, the clinical expert doesn't know the informatics. And the informatics doesn't know the, 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 the expertise of the clinician. So it's, it's tricky. Um, more recently, uh, Griffin talked a lot about this as well, is uh, using co-occurrence data or uh, sparse uh, embedding regression to select um, features, relevant features. And, and, and this is kind of a simple idea. It's you look at your data and say, what, 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 what is co-occurring? What is happening? At the same time as you're 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 getting that a patient is getting that diagnosis. So if a patient gets a type two diabetes diagnosis, then you would expect them to have metformin within 30 days or an HbA1c. And so using empirical data, we can look at uh, selecting features. And oops, sorry. Um, and so this is uh, in the pa in the Kessler paper. It will create kind of a, this network. And so you can look at. You pick up one node in the in network, and it'll show you things that are related. Uh, and then you can use those features. And so you've you've reduced your space of hundreds of thousands of concepts to, let's say, 100. Um, and that's that's great, and that actually has shown to work. And I think that's what Griffin built into his um, uh, I2B2 digital twin. What we wanted to do is look at uh, using large language models for feature selection. And, and the motivation for this is that uh, oftentimes, we might have a phenotype that is not very well defined. It's not a condition. It's not a fee code. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it might be a newer uh, phenomenon. Uh, and so we thought, well, the la large language model is kind of involving and uh, is, is a little smarter and can do things uh, like agent-based tasks. Uh, and so we built, I, I've been prototyping this workflow of, of using the large language model to get to um, the, some, some relevant features. Um, so I'll talk about this part of the, this is the whole workflow. Uh, I'll talk about this, this first square. And uh, I've been using uh, GPT-4. Um, and I'm not uh, sending any PHI. So uh, basically what happens is uh, a user specifies a phenotype. Uh, and the example I'll be giving uh, using in this talk is called brain fog. So relevant to long COVID, people report they have brain fog. There's not an ICD-10 code for brain fog. There's not a fee code for brain fog. It's just this kind of amorphous thing. Um, and so uh, we can use the... 
uh, GPT-4, and this is all done using prompt engineering, uh, and 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 we've tweaked back and forth the prompts to kind of optimize them uh, to get a response. And so here's what a prompt looks like. Uh, so hopefully you can read this. Um, and there's uh, a prompt for conditions, a prompt for procedures, a prompt for medications, and a prompt for lab tests. Uh, and so we say, I say, you are computable phenotype GPT, uh, and you're you want to identify relevant diagnoses and conditions. Um, and then uh, I, I want to know not just uh, what are the ICD-10 or the features related to the phenotype in, that are, are directly uh, relevant to the phenotype, but also maybe differential phenotypes that might help a computable phenotype algorithm distinguish from other diseases or other phenotypes. And then one thing that really helped, um, this is going back to the, the agent and the, the, the back and forth, is I asked it to confirm the ICD-10 codes. When I first started doing this, I was doing this in GPT 3.5, and I, it would get good responses, but the codes would be really off. So it would be like, what, what code is that? It would just make it up. Uh, and so uh, I asked it to confirm that, and actually that's improved. And that's one of the pieces that's actually improved quite a bit. I've been using GPT-4 uh, Omega, I think it's, or Omni 4.0. Uh, and that seems like when I ask it to do that, it actually can go and search the internet to confirm the code. So it is doing that in the background uh, as part of the, the API call. Uh, and this is all done in the, using a Python library that's calling the API on uh, OpenAI. So it's confirming the code, uh, and I'm also asking it to provide the highest level code that's relevant, because as we saw before, there's a lot of codes. Maybe if you say asthma, well, there's a lot of them. So I want to look at the par part of the tree that's most relevant, because I don't want to have 30 codes for asthma. I just want to have one that might be the most uh, relevant, um, and and that, that could be at different levels for different phenotypes. Um, and then I also asked it not to guess, because <laughs> sometimes it was guessing, because uh, it wanted to give me an answer. And so uh, this is less relevant for the conditions, but uh, sometimes I'm asking for uh, a phenotype that's weird and that might not have a medication. And it was always giving me medications, even though it really shouldn't, and so I've, I've asked it to, like, Take it easy. Don't don't guess. Uh, and so and, and say it's okay to not provide an answer. And I, I think that actually made quite a difference. Um, so these are all things that I've been iterating back and forth. Uh, and so then then the most importantly is I I provided it some examples. So these are two phenotypes we built in the past, and these are the ones that we actually sat down with the experts. Uh, and so I gave it some codes uh, that I knew were related. That if I, if, I were, if I were asking it for rheumatoid arthritis, this is kind of what I would expect. Uh, and so I gave it two examples, uh, and you can actually give it more examples. An interesting thing is the order of these examples makes a difference. And so um, I've been playing around with like the ordering of the entire prompt, where, where how you give it the information uh, and the examples uh, across the different um, uh, data types. All right, so so I've so this is the the system prompt, which is in in GPT four or GPT. The way you do it is you have a system prompt, which is like the instructions to the LLM, and then the user prompt, and this is what you can enter into the into the the code into the script. Is so you prompt it and say, "What is your phenotype?" So the bottom there is a user prompt. So then you just all the user has to do is enter brain fog, um, and this is the response. So. Uh, it, and this is the response not just for conditions, it's for all of, all four of them. Uh, so you'll see it has provided me some things here about there's not, there isn't an ICD-10 code for brain fog, but it thought maybe mild, mild cognitive impairment, so stated, uh, would be a relevant one. Uh, and interestingly, um, I, I, you know, I, I haven't done anything other than tell it brain fog. It actually gave me the U09.9 code, which is uh, the long COVID code. Uh, and so that's a new code. The code actually only started, I think, 2021 or 22. Um, and it, it knew to provide that code. Um, and, and, and then it's given me, it's sort of like the, there's not a medication for brain fog, but it's given me some medications. Uh, I've asked it for medications to provide both RX norm codes and the drug classes, uh, the, the VA drug class. Uh, and so it can do that. 
um, it hasn't provided me any here in for brain fog. Uh, and then CPT for uh, procedure codes, I've also asked it to provide uh, HCPCS codes. Sometimes it does that. Uh, and then lab tests, uh, loin codes. And here it's just providing me blood pressure, uh, CBC, like kind of a generic thing. Yeah. All right, so, so we have this response from the LLM, now what, <laughs> right? So uh, the next big step here is the middle step here, which is mapping that to, uh, to ontolo the ontology. Uh, and this is the legacy <laughs> approach. So uh, I could probably be a lot more sophisticated, but I've built a stored procedure that takes that CSV formatted response uh, and then uh, does some logic to find the right um, uh, place in the ontology. So uh, we, uh, we have a project for called Recover um, that has a data set of patients that are consented into a long COVID study. And we actually have uh, linked EHR data to those, to those uh, participants. Uh, and we use Michelle's ACT ontology, ACT OMOP ontology. Um, and so right now the store procedure works on that ontology. So it's saying, okay, I have this response. I have the ICD-10 code. So usually that's pretty good, but not always. And so, so I kind of do some checking to make sure that that code exists. Uh, sometimes I do need to like go up the tree or down the tree, depending on using the counts. Um, and sometimes, especially the Rx norm codes are wrong. So it'll, it'll just give me like some random number that I don't know why. Uh, but it turns out with, it does give me the right label. So the ingredient label is correct. Uh, and so I can kind of use that to confirm or maybe try to find another one. Uh, so it's, it's kind of that, that, that mapping step, I would say has a lot of room for improvement. Um, but I think that is the step that we can probably use functions and agents to better uh, identify the right point in the tree that we can include um, in, in the features. All right, so now we have our features. Uh, and so I've started doing uh, this preliminary proof of concept to actually build a computable phenotypes to say how well are these features uh, how useful are these features in building a computable phenotype? So in this little uh, analysis, um, I, we, again, I have for recover, we have uh, about 1,200 patients that have patient-reported symptoms. And one of those patient-reported symptoms is brain fog. Uh, and so, uh, so we have the EHR data, and then we have uh, survey data. So they report I'm having brain fog. Uh, and that could be uh, at any point in time. And so my goal is to build a computable phenotyping algorithm with just EHR data to identify patients who report brain fog from the surveys. So they, you know, the algorithm doesn't know that, that the patient has reported the survey. And the idea is that you can use that in other contexts, other larger EHR data sets, for example, once you have an algorithm. Uh, and so I'm doing the simplest computable phenotype algorithm possible, which is temporally naive. So basically, it's not constraining by time, which in a real, real use case, you probably would constrain by time. Um, and so this is just saying I, I ever reported uh, uh, brain fog and then also the EHR data can happen at any time. It could happen before or after. Um, and then, so the predictors I'm using are the LLM selected features. And then so the target is the brain uh, report, the patient reported brain fog. Um, and I'm using lasso logistic regression, which is usually our, our go-to model, which is just a regularized regression. So if you saw that list of about 20 LLM selected features, the lasso is gonna further refine that list to the most relevant for training the model. Um, and so this is a kind of a typical lasso plot when with each line is a feature and it is uh, trying to find the, the minimal set of features that it could use uh, to predict the model in a cross-validated way. And it turns out it performs pretty good. So I've, I've actually done three versions of it. Um, one is using only the features, the conditions, like the first six that you saw there, well, only using the, the drugs. And the drugs actually do worse. Oh, if you only use the drugs, it does worse, but not that bad. And then if you do everything together, it actually does pretty good. So I can do, I can get an AUC. This is just each point here is, is a participant. Um, the green ones are the ones that reported brain fog. The red ones are the ones who didn't. And, um, 
this is where the, the model is putting the, the logistic regression model is, is the prediction probability is on the axis here, the x-axis. And so this is, and then we report AUC, which is discrimination. So you can see with conditions, I can get 0.712, but if you use everything together, I can get to 0.829. So I was encouraged by these uh, things to say, yeah, maybe you should keep going. All right. Um, so kind of joining this back to uh, the previous demos and talks. Um, so uh, this is really cool for feature selection, uh, but it can probably have to figure out how we can, and, and I've been evaluating it by training the model, but I don't really know what I'm missing, right? So I don't know that if I, if the, if the LLM responds with something that it didn't, it, it missed the right things. Uh, and I could probably do better, maybe I could do better in training a computable phenotype model. Uh, and so I've been, we've been thinking about how to do a more formal evaluation of the, the responses the, themselves and the code, the mapping to the codes, uh, and then mapping specifically to the, the ACT ontology. Uh, and we have some prior data and we can use Kesser results, uh, the embeddings to compare those. And maybe it's not a comparison of like which one is right, but maybe an agreement situation. Um, so we can do that in a kind of in bulk. Uh, and then, uh, so also uh, we have some that have some experts uh, that have curated features. Um, and then uh, we talk, I talked about uh, integrating functions and agents. And so uh, GPT itself has been doing a lot of work in this area. And so uh, as I mentioned, the GPT 4.0 is actually doing searching of the internet. Uh, and there's a functionality in, in the API that you can actually have Python functions within that you can con configure. Um, and, and again, the mapping process is still a bit of a work in progress. Uh, and then uh, automating that pipeline. So from the beginning, from, from getting, from entering, from the user entering the phenotype to building out uh, the file that goes to R for, to train a lasso model. Uh, there's a lot of work that we can do to automate that. Uh, and then how do we leverage this approach um, and link it to what uh, Mike and Nikolai are doing to help people build queries, right? Because sometimes maybe you don't want to build a computable phenotyping algorithm. You just care about a disease and you want to know what are the relevant things that are related to that disease and you might not know that, right? You're not a, an expert on asthma, and so you just want to know what, what are the medications and the procedures related to that when you're building your query. And so I think that has a lot of applications here as well. All right. Okay, Michelle has a question. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I have two questions. Did you ever think about uh, using like the eMERGE phenotypes as a um, comparison to figure out if, you know, how well they're performing since those have been curated so well? Um, that's a good idea. No, I hadn't thought about that. Um, you mean in terms of the performance or the features in the eMERGE phenotypes? The features in the eMERGE. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Those are, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was my one question, which made me forget my second question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it again. Maybe it'll come back to me. I had two questions. I can't find it. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. You can ask me, in, in, and, I, and I, I didn't do a live demo, but I'm happy to show anyone the prompts or the, uh, the uh, using the actual script. Um, are, are all of the um, things that you're mapping to, are you always doing uh, the positive, and are there any, like, negated kind of concepts? Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, no. Uh, so the mapping itself is only doing to the positive, but in theory, you could actually do a negation in the building of the computable phenotype. So for right. each one of those things, you can say not just the presence of something, but the absence of it or everything right. else. Like, in yeah. the emerged, like, uh, 
type 2 diabetes, one of the things they want to make sure is that they don't have type 1 diabetes in right. their codes. Yeah. And that's yeah. also an indicator. So I am doing the differential diagnoses, which is like, so if you typed in type 2 diabetes, it would give you type 1 diabetes. And then the model, when you build a model, it would give that a negative coefficient, hopefully, right, to say if someone has more type 1 diabetes, they're less likely to have type 2 diabetes. Although I don't know if that's actually true because <laughs> it's so miscoded. Okay. Have you considered training an embedding model or using an embedding model? How does this, you know, that GPT-4 level prompt compared to um, just doing a vector search on some of those concepts? I have not, but only because it does pretty well with just the prompt engineering, right? It, it, it's surprisingly well. There's so much flexibility in the prompt itself, um, but it, it probably it might improve things uh, a bit. Yeah, and there's a lot of op opportunities to go in different directions. Um, so yeah. And have you considered a prompt optimization library like Dispy? No, I haven't. Like? Yeah, what, is it, what do those do? Uh, it's cool, you give it the skeleton of your prompt and you collect user responses, either upvote or downvote. Okay. And you feed that back and it'll optimize your prompts to get a better oh. user response. That's cool, I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, thanks. All right, All right. Thank, thank you, you Victor. Appreciate it.